Now in Anglia, our new series about the Christian soldiers marching as to war. I've come here to Nottingham to tell you the story of an army. Not his army, that's Robin Hood. Every year, thousands of people come here because of the legend of this man who robbed the rich to give to the poor. But there was a real live hero born here in Nottingham, and he didn't have to do that because the rich actually gave him money to help the poor. He didn't lead a band of merry men against an evil sheriff. His was a great company of happy warriors marching as to war against the devil. He was William Booth, founder and first general of the Salvation Army, a band that shall conquer the foe. We're a band that shall conquer the Booth was born in this house, number 12, Nottingham Place, on the 10th of April, 1829. His father, Samuel Booth, was a small-time builder who could neither read nor write. Well, when young William was only 13 years old, the family business crashed, and his father died of the shock just shortly afterwards, but not before young William had become apprenticed to a Mr. Eames, pawnbroker of Nottingham's Goose Gate. Now, on his meagre earnings, he had to help support a widowed mother and three younger sisters. Poor himself, young William witnessed the poverty around him. In the so-called hungry forties, starving rioters ripped the railings up from this very street as they fought with government troops. And across the pawn shop counter, William saw the poor people struggling to save their self-respect. Sunday scarves and trinkets came first. Wedding rings last. The Booth household was not particularly religious. William described his father as a grab-and-get merchant, more interested in money than God. But God was very real to young William and had to be obeyed. Like his boyhood hero, John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, he believed that God loved the poor. Now, when Wesley found that the mass of poor were not in the churches, he'd stormed the country in a remarkable series of outdoor preaching campaigns to bring them in and help save their souls.
But when William Booth walked up Broad Street to his local Methodist church, the poor people were not there. Not, that is, until one evening in 1846. The other side of that door, the Reverend Samuel Dunn presided from a red cushioned throne whilst the congregation sang Rock of Ages Cleft for Me. On these steps, a 17-year-old William Booth, together with a shabby, unwashed collection of rough men and women that he'd gathered up from the bottoms, Nottingham's notorious slums, where they'd rather go to prison than go to church. Well, he ushered them in, through that door, into the best pews that were reserved and paid for by the well-to-do. Well, the congregation of respectable tradespeople were absolutely scandalised. The door for the poor people is at the side, and so are the seats. Broad Street Chapel is now a co-op centre, but a plaque still commemorates William Booth's early witness that if there is no class distinction in heaven, there can be none in the church on earth. Any poor sinner can come to Jesus. The year 1865 saw William Booth striding down London's White Chapel Road, where we are at the moment. He'd become a Methodist minister in order to help the poor, as he had done in Nottingham. But when the Methodist church again cramped Booth's style, he resigned. There was a market here in Booth's day. The customers then emerged from a labyrinth of stinking streets and rotting tenements, many of them just wearing rags and sleeping on bare boards. You could buy cheese that had been impregnated with red lead to make it look like double Gloucester. And I find this hard to believe. You could buy a goldfinch in a cage that had had its eyes pricked and blinded to make it sing more sweetly. Over behind the London hospital, the Thames was nothing more than a large open sewer. And when the cholera struck, the hospital couldn't even start to cope with the dying. For half a million people, drink seemed the only escape from squalor and degradation. Every fifth shop was a gin shop. And children as young as five years old died from cirrhosis of the liver. That's alcohol poisoning. Men crazed with drink fought one another, urged on by screaming women. What chance was there for people who had to live like this? 
and yet some had an answer. Here, outside the blind beggar public house, Booth came across a group of street evangelists. He stopped to listen. Something about him caught their attention. He was, after all, quite an imposing figure. He stood over six feet tall, had a smart black beard and strong, dark eyes. The leader asked Booth if he would uh, like to have a word. As Booth began to speak, passers-by stopped in their tracks, and pretty soon, a crowd had gathered. Here was a preacher with a difference. He could talk about God using everyday terms that anybody could understand. Well, for the missioners, this was an answer to prayer. The evangelist who was to take their tent meetings had fallen ill. Would Booth like to take his place? Booth said he would. The missioners sighted their tent here, which is now a children's playground in Valence Road. And this plaque commemorates the very first meeting that William Booth had on the 2nd of July, 1865. The sundial is the spot where they pitched the tent, which, from all accounts, was rather ancient and very badly ventilated. It was lit by a naphtha lamp, which hissed and swung above the heads of the working-class congregation as they crowded in on the rough wooden seats night after night to hear William Booth tell them how God could change their lives and give them hope. There were others who greeted Booth with jeers and catcalls. Rotten eggs were bad enough, but stones and vicious missiles often left him battered and bleeding. But by the time the early storms and rains of autumn closed the tent down for the last time, Booth had acquired quite a following. So, where did they go now? Along here in New Road, a certain Professor Orson had got a dancing academy. Booth hired it for a guinea a Sunday. By about four o'clock in the morning, as the fiddles died down and the last of the professor's clients clattered down these steps, Booth's army of faithful converts were waiting to move in 300 seats for the morning meeting. But these people were so poor that even with those numbers, a guinea a week was far too expensive. And yet, almost every week, a gold sovereign was found in the collection box by the door. And no one ever knew who put it there. understood the East Enders' reluctance to enter an unfamiliar church or chapel, but there was one place he knew of, besides the pub, where they felt totally at home. This wall is all that's left of the old Effingham Theatre on Whitechapel Road. In its day, one of the great Victorian music halls. They turn up there, all right. People go for funny drinks and down and buy the pail Like coffee, cocoa, tea or milk or even Adam's ale For my part you can keep the lot, I never would complain I never touch the blooming stuff, I only drink champagne For oh, champagne, Charlie is me name Champagne drinking is me game There's no drink 
drink as good as fizz, fizz, fizz. I'll drink every drop there is, is, is. All round town it is the same. My pop, 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 I rose to fame. I'm the idol of the barmaids. Champagne Charlie is me name. Booth hired the Effingham Theatre on Sunday evenings and advertised for 3,000 people to come and fill it. Well, a lot of idle and dissolute characters filled the stalls and the boxes, but Booth held their attention. And then Booth and his early Salvationists did more than take over the actual theatre. They took over the music as well. Well, if a man was happy that he'd discovered his saviour, why not use a tune that everybody knew to let everybody know? So Champagne Charlie became this. Bless his name, he sets me free. Bless his name, he sets me free. Oh, the blood, the precious blood, I'm trusting in the cleansing flood. Bless his name, he sets me free. Bless his name, he sets me free. I know the past is washed away And now in Jesus I am free In Jesus I am free I'm free Over 80 music hall songs acquired religious lyrics and Booth wasn't too sure about this approach and he didn't finally make up his mind until he heard that song sung in a Worcester music hall by a chap called George Sailor Fielder. He was a converted sea captain. That's a very nice song, said Booth. What tune is it? Well, knowing of Booth's horror of drink and the consequences, of course, the answer was somewhat shamefaced and just a little bit nervous. Uh, Champagne Charlie. Booth listened to the crescendo of happy voices singing. That does it, he cried. Why should the devil have all the best tunes? I wandered and stumbled for many a year In misery, darkness and sin Knowing my Savior would freely forgive all those who would turn unto him. But oh, when I heard that my Lord's love was true, and he mercy was willing to show, I sought and I found him without more ado, and now I thank God that I know. Oh, see. 
find out how today's army is coping with the problems of poverty and popular appeal, I went first to talk with Colonel John Gowans. Does the army still care for the poor people as it used to, or has it become a little bit more respectable these days? Oh, I don't know about respectable, but we're getting a bit more sophisticated, that's true. Many of our social institutions have highly qualified social workers with their diplomas all over the wall, and we tend to get in that sense a little further away from the really poor people. But it's not true entirely. I mean, I spent five years in California, and we dole out the soup every night in Los Angeles, and I'm back in Paris, and we do the same thing here. And each winter, hundreds and hundreds of street people are housed in our temporary shelters in a very superficial way, but uh, it's something uh, that we can do for the poor. That still happens, 120-odd years after William Booth started it all. I've been to a few Christian festivals where they feature pop music like Greenbelt and Spring Harvest, where 20,000 young Christians all turn up and they have a whale of a time with the music of today. Now, how does the army feel about that? Well, I like the idea of 20,000 Christians getting together, but I rather like more the idea of 20,000 Christians getting out there, uh, telling what they've got to tell and saying what they've got to say. Mm -hmm. And uh, to that extent, it appeals to the army. We used to have uh, quite a, a well-known rhythm group, perhaps you've even heard about it. I don't know if you're old enough, really. It was uh, begun by Major Joy Webb of the army, called the Joy Strings. Mm -hmm. Oh, it must be 30-something years ago. But that was a breakthrough. The army began then to... Uh, to use popular music uh, in, a, in a really effective way, and Major Webb did a fantastic job. Mm. Even got into the charts with some of her stuff, which took some doing in those days. You know. Joy, that was 20 years ago. Is the army still keeping up with the contemporary music? Oh, yes. I'm actually responsible for all the contemporary music in Great Britain. Uh, and what sort of stuff are they all playing? Oh, they're proper rock groups, you know. Some play folk, of course, and we've got one or two that are uh, attempting heavy metal. <laughs> yes. And, and what do you think of them? How are they doing? Oh, they do ever so well, really. Mm. Um, varying standards, but they do very well. And you yourself now, what are you up to? Well, uh, I, as I say, I'm the officer for contemporary music, but I also have drama under my wing as well. And just at the present moment, we're busy getting together uh, an arts centre at Marylebone. We're taking one of the old Salvation Army halls over, making it into a studio theatre, and we're hoping to teach people how to perform and to enhance the gospel using the art forms. In the early days, of course, uh, Parodying popular songs was allowed, but that's not allowed anymore because of copyright. So how do you get around that one? Oh, it's true that we can't uh, adapt the, the popular song of today because there are copyright laws. So now we have to write our own. And we haven't got the skill, I suppose, to write exactly what we want, but at least we try. And one of the things that we've been trying in recent years is uh, to use the medium of the musical. Uh, it seems an odd thing for the Salvation Army to produce musicals, and yet it's not so odd when you think about it. The Army began in the music hall, so it's quite natural, really, that the Army should still use uh, music as a way of uh, getting its message across. Well, and so... Was used the Army, didn't it? Guys and Dolls? Uh, uh, yeah, in <laughs> fact, Guys and Dolls was responsible, really. Oh, it's nearly 20 years ago. The, the Army started to think about musicals and said, why, why can't we write something of our own along the lines of Guys and Dolls? Well, we hadn't got a Marlon Brando, of course. There was only uh, ourselves. Yeah. So John Larson and I were told, were told, you get instructed in the Salvation Army. You don't get asked, you see. You, you get a kind of a line of command. You do as you're told. We were told to write a musical. Mm -hmm. Well, we hardly knew each other, and we'd never written a musical in our lives before. But, you know, orders is orders. So we got to work and produced the first Salvation Army musical in 67. That shows how old we are now, really. Which was that one? Um, Takeover Bid. Uh -huh. Sounds a nice modern title, doesn't it? Oh, Takeover Bid tells the story of how a group of young people in the Salvation Army church decided that what the church needed was to be taken over by them, and they'd run the place, and then things would go well. Well, things went well for a while, but the story tells how they needed a little help themselves eventually. 
Ray, you've been dance director for Oscar Hammerstein II. Yes, I was, and I've danced all over the world. In Australia, America, and all over Europe. And in West End musicals? Yes, the last show I did was a Vita. And I was in a Vita for 18 months at the Prince Edward Theatre. It's great. Mm. But you're giving that up now. You're going to be a Salvation Army officer, so what kind of a challenge in life now? Well, there are many challenges, but one of the challenges would be to produce Salvation Army musicals. And as you know, with a big budget and big theatres and so on, you have the resources to create a spectacular. But in the Salvation Army, our resources and budgets are very small. So we can produce shows like Jesus Folk, which I've done at the Salvation Army Citadel in Up and Allwood. And we had great fun, and it was a great challenge also. On a shoestring. On a shoestring. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus folk? Some kind of a joke? Who on earth are the Jesus folk? Rich man, poor man, beggar man, thief, black man, white man, underman, cheap, gruff folk, rough folk, tough folk too, young folk, old folk, rough like you. Jesus folk, that 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 that. Jesus folk, Jesus folk, Jesus folk, that 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 that. This bust marks the early preaching of Booth on the Mile End Waste and the folk who pioneered the Salvation Army of today. But a better memorial might be a barroom door. His son, Bramwell Booth, always recalled how his father pointed him to the dimly lit interior of a public house. He smelt the reek of gin and the stench of shag tobacco. Women suckled their children and men swore oaths. Booth said quietly, these are our people. These are the people I want you to live for and bring to Christ.